Not a very good I like your attitude, Eric. Not, not sure I believe it. Do you have it correct? Otherwise, I <laughs> it's all right. I'm I'm totally need lots of help because I asked somebody to have all the slides ready and they're not here and they're not ready and they're not up because I just came from the Korean standards practice meeting. Oh, well, you know, it's free help, right? That I was trying to get, so you can't twist that. Oh. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Can I need to flip that? Okay, put you as far away. All right, no problem. I'll do it on the fly. I'm totally unprepared this morning. Thank you. And so, Richard, thank you so much. Um, if, if I can, like, I, I was going to be able to switch over to my laptop for some pictures. Did I show you the pictures I had ready? You'd be proud. Oh, you saw them already. Oh, you got to see this picture. I'll, I'll try to do this. Yeah. Well, uh, who are they? Um, I have no idea. And this, the internet is so slow to me. I'm just going to be a couple of minutes. I'm sorry. I was coming from another meeting, and I thought somebody would have the slides ready for me. And uh, I so slight delay. And I'm having trouble with the network. So hopefully... I may have to have presenters. Um, I hate to ask people to like get off their laptop for a couple minutes so I could. Uh, my connection sucks. I right. can't download anything right now. No, no problem. I'm getting this like can't be reached all of a sudden. <coughs> um, idiot doesn't work either though, so I think it's the network. Come on. Oh, sorry. Um, I think oh, so, so I don't recommend it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's actually it looks like that. Yes, that's that's a good idea. I seriously not here. So my network isn't working. Um I have the slides. Back, so you can't detect but if you yeah. could run all the other slides and sure. if you want to sit up here with me, that would be amazing. Thank you. All right, great. So I can get started in a couple of minutes as soon as um oh, very good. Sorry for my uh, difficulties. It was just I was running from one thing to the next this morning. Um, well, not all right. I should plug in too. Yeah, I have zero battery, so hopefully it has some before. So as you probably have noticed this week, Stephen's not here. He wasn't able to make it last minute. Um, so thanks for everyone who's been able to help. This is the Security Area Advisory Group meeting. If you intend to be someplace else, um, now's your chance. And we'll get started. So here is the note well. 
And our agenda today, uh, there was a little agenda bashing. Um, the effect of ubiquitous encryption is going to get bumped down uh, to later in the um, list of presentations. Any other agenda bashing? All right, great. So now we're going to run through working groups. And last I checked, there's a whole slew of them that um, did not send in their report. So when I call a working group that hasn't sent the report, usually we have much more, so that's why I'm explaining this. Um, you'll need to get up to the mic and, and explain, you know, give a short summary of what happened in that working group. So ACE, I don't think we got any summary from ACE yet. That's, that's okay. Um, a report can get sent, so if someone wants to give a little overview for ACE and what's going to happen, that would be great. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, we do typically have people send reports in before meetings as well, um, just with a status of what might occur. Um, ACME? All right, thank you. Uh, COSY did not meet in there. Probably going to close today, so I won't make them get up. Um, their work is completed. They've done a great job. There's just one tiny little um, piece to get solved in a draft that should, should wrap up quick. Uh, Curdle, I know they meet later in the week, but oh, I thought Ben was getting up to say something. Do I have to say more than we meet Friday? Uh, we have a bunch of drafts, a couple in last call. It's progressing. They're all short, simple to understand, if you, even if you don't know the math, <laughs> which I don't. Dane, I got a report to SAG, I believe. I can do that quickly. Um, yeah, so Dane's not meeting this time. We have an S-MIME draft, which is going through working group last call again. Um, if anybody would be willing to review it, we'd really, really, really appreciate it. Um, the whole putting emails in email addresses in the DNS um, isn't really in scope for this working group last call, because we did that in an RFC. And so, you know, um, this does the same thing as that. Um, and then we may have one other working group business piece. We'll find out uh, early next year if that's going to progress. Other than that, we might be done. That was Dane. Okay, dots. Thank you. Uh, HTTP auth, they should be closing within a few days. I won't make them get up. So thank you for your work in that working group as well. I2 and SF, I don't think I saw a report for them. Um, no. Uh, can someone report for I2 and SF, please? Any participants? I guess the chairs aren't in the room. Bob Moskowitz, uh, I was there. We met. <laughs> <laughs> we're moving, making some. They're making headway in the drafts and uh, um, the Yang modeling and and the uh, for for the various messaging and and the structures. So, just uh, a few documents adopted by the uh, the work group. Progress being made, but a lot more to go. Thank you. Uh, IP SecMe. I think we have a report. Thank you. Kitten. We received a report. Thank you. Lamps. I think we got a re no, no report for lamps. I don't think they've met yet, but does someone want to give a since Russ doesn't seem to be coming up. Uh there's three drafts. Uh the one one has gone into last call. The other two are expected to go into last call um mid of December, early January. Thank you. Mile. I don't think I've seen a report from Mile either. They have Friday afternoon. Friday afternoon. Does anyone want to talk about the drafts? There's a bunch going into last call soon with transports. Um, and I know there's interest from other working groups too in some of those drafts because it's data formats. Go ahead. So Mile has not met. Uh, there is the data model in Auth 48. There is really being talked about a couple of the transport documents, and I think the implementation report's about to be pushed out. 
Thank you. OAuth. I don't think we got a report for OAuth, and they did meet twice. And Hannes is gone, so he's off the hook. Anyone else um, want to get up for OAuth? There's got to be a few OAuth people in the room. <clears throat> Mike Jones, Microsoft. We discussed the status of a number of current drafts, plus Torsten Lauterstad uh, wrote a new draft that's an intended BCP on OAuth security best practices, which deployments have shown the need for. That was, I believe, going to be adopted as a working group document. Thank you. Uh, open, G open PGP sense, there's SACM. Thank you. Uh, SEC events, thank you. Uh, TLS was sent, I remember seeing that one. Toke bind, I don't think, oh, okay. Thank you. Uh, trans was sent, and now related working groups. All right, so I know I saw one for Anima. Um, would anyone from the related working groups want to uh, get up and so Anima, Dime, uh, Dime did not meet this time. Dispatch, anyone want to give an overview for Dispatch? DMARC, a little bit of a hot topic this week. All right, uh, Deprive. Deprive hasn't met yet, uh, meeting tomorrow. Um, We've finished our phase one work and we'll be having a bar buff or a buff style discussion in the meeting on what we're going to be doing with the phase two work. Um, I think that that's the, we have some documents which are progressing. All right, great, thank you. Uh, HTTP biz. Quick. There has to be someone in the room that went to that. <laughs> Matt decided who was editing the documents. There wasn't a whole lot of discussion of detail. Thanks, Ted. Come, come on, we got the Indianist settled. It was like that's a big true. Thing, we did right? settle Indianist. We're, we're network bite order again, man. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you both. Uh, Netconf. Uh, Perk. So Perk met, um, we're trying to wrap up our kind of media crypto layer stuff. Um, we've got some extensions to TLS related to key transfer and some uh, tweaks to SRT, a new protection profile for SRTP that does some funny crypto stuff. So uh, review would be welcome. Um, we should have last calls coming up on those soon. Thank you, Richard. Uh, Radext. So almost all of the drafts are either IESG or RC at the moment. Uh, we're basically getting ready to rev the TLS documents. Thank you. Uh, TCP Inc. All right, Kyle Rose. So uh, we haven't met yet. We're meeting tomorrow at 9.30. Um, we're hoping to be to get to working group last call on the two main documents uh, shortly after the meeting. Um, the other issue that I think we're going to talk about is some of the crypto questions that I pose to CFRG, so, but we're going to hold that for later in the meeting. So hopefully TLS will be done early and some folks from there can come to TCP Inc. Thank you. And Utah. Um, Utah haven't met this time. Um, basically, chair is waiting update for, for main documents for MTA. Uh, opportunistic security and other things. So it's a bit slow, but um, I think there is <coughs> progress. Thanks, Alexi. Uh, so IRTF, CFRG. Thank you. IRTF open. All right, uh, PrivSec program for the IEB. Um. Not on PrivSec. Oh, actually, Ted, please. Uh, it, it actually meets tomorrow morning, so it has not yet met. Uh, it will be talking about the Web PKI document and the mitigations draft, as well as the 
um, metadata insertion, although my understanding from Stephen is that the metadata insertion draft uh, will actually proceed as an IETF document that he will sponsor rather than staying in the IEB. Thank you. And then W3C. Thanks. Uh, sent an update. Uh, lots of work going on in W3C's web application security group, uh, web authentication, and web payments. And uh, there's a hardware-based secure services community group that's uh, going through uh, the W3C equivalent phase of BOF and consideration for, for working groups. So people interested uh, in any of that can follow the links. Thank you. IEEE? I can at least talk to 802.1 work, which is coming on, which is particularly going to affect, may affect here. Um, 802.1 AR addendum, which is the uh, device certificate, device identity, which is used in Anima and uh, in, in NetConf. Um, that is being changed to a revision, and uh, that's adding the uh, SHA-384 and P384 um, curves to uh, support it within uh, device identity. And uh, that is pretty much out of uh, um, um, the task the, the the task group uh, last call going on to the work group. So I can't really say when I go on a sponsor ballot, but uh, maybe uh, er early 2017. Um, the uh, um, the Ethernet uh, encryption uh, 8021 AE addendum is again that's adding uh, the uh, um, support for the uh, um, um, 250 um, AS 256. So uh, that's that's moving along, and just a side note that uh, Yang da Data Modeling for Data 21X is revealing some interesting um, different ways of looking at Data 21X, which uh, that that may have implications uh, um, to to some uses of that. Hard to say what impact that'll have on IETF. Thank you. All right, so we didn't have any security bops. Um, Margaret, did you want to talk about Banana now? Just to fake it without slides? Yes, please. Just a quick, if there's more time at open mic, we can yeah. go. There's to um, a BOF going to be held tomorrow at 1.30. Uh, I think it's in Grand Ballroom. No, it's in Park Ballroom 1, I think, um, called the Banana BOF. Uh, it's bandwidth aggregation for network access. Um, basically, the problem for the BOF is that you have uh, non-multi-access aware hosts on a home or small office network likely that have more than one point of attachment to the internet. Um, and uh, when you normally use this sort of host to do, say, a big data uh, download, um, you only end up using one of your links to the internet because wh whichever gateway you pick is the one that you end up using. Uh, but we want to figure out how to do bandwidth aggregation across multiple links to the internet. There are a number of solutions being discussed in this space, including a tunneling solution and uh, using an MPTCP proxy. Um, there are a bunch of security concerns. They differ based on what solution and what scenario. Uh, and the solutions, as I said, are different technologies. The scenarios are, um, do we just act, you know, split the traffic and reconverge in the operator network, assuming the links are from the same operator? Do we do it somewhere in the internet? assuming there's some sort of bandwidth aggregation service provider, or do we do it on the other edge? And um, the security varies a lot there, but but various security issues are a concern about man-in-the-middle attacks, concerning about um, being able to redirect your traffic to an attacker, and uh, we would love to get some security people in the room to help make sure we know what those issues are. Thank you. You you said tomorrow. I, it's I'm today. Sorry, it's today at 1.30. Sorry. And I forgot one very important thing. Can I have a Jabber um, scribe and somebody to take minutes for the rest of the meeting? Get some Jabber scribes. Oh, thank you. All right, great um, minutes. Should be pretty easy from here on out. I'll have to go back and do the, the ones from the video. Thank you. <laughs> All right, presentation. So we have uh, Professor Yum. Uh, first up, on an overview of information security relevant work in Korea. So if you want to 
Oh, am I from? Okay, yes. So if you if you can come up now, and um, I don't think we have your slides, so we'll have to plug you in directly. Thank you. I'll just move. Let it work. So you can either sit here or stand there to give the talk. You want to sit? You want to stand? Yes. Thank you. So, 30 minutes, 20 minutes, uh, 20 minutes. 30, minutes. 30 minutes. Good morning. Uh, my name, my name is Hung Yal Yam. I'm working for Sun Chenyang University as a professor. So I will talk about the uh, information security relevance work in Korea. So I would like to thank for all of you who invited me to make a presentation on this uh, topics, since I believe that this is Korea, so this is the advantage of the host, I believe, yes. So my uh, presentation uh, consists of three parts. First one is a recent uh, cybersecurity lands landscapes, and the second one is a information security governance and uh, best practice, and third one is a uh, some information security relevance work in Korea. So I will present one by one. So actually, uh, first, uh, first, if you look at this slide, it's a cyber uh, security landscape in Korea. So we have supported many DDoS attacks, and also we have supported the APT, uh, advanced persistence threats also, and we have supported a disruptive uh, attacks. Target would be a internet service provider and also uh, some telecom operators, including KT. And we have supported several uh, personal data leakage instances. And we have a unique uh, uh, national identification number that is a uh, residence registration number. So this is target of the uh, this uh, instance. And this is a typical scenario with have support in Korea. So uh, act actually attackers a pumps a, a pumps a bond net a consists of the more than ten thousand uh but impacted computers in the center, and they use say, this uh, but impacted computer to uh, make a DDoS attack to the several uh, websites, including the government sites and also some internet service provider sites. So that is the main targets. So, and then we have support a uh, several uh, cyber security instance. For example, uh, on July seventh, two thousand nine, uh, seven seven cyber disaster attack has been happened, and then target includes more than forty websites. We believe that this is first uh, massive DDoS attack in Korea. So we, uh, after these sessions, uh, some. Uh, uh, security measures are in a strength has been strengthened, and then second one is is a uh, on March fourth, two thousand eleven, uh, we call three four cyber security attacks. Also, uh, this is a uh, DDoS attack is a, a national wide DDoS attack, including target includes a Korean blouse and also government ministry in, uh, website and major financial organization and ICT service providers. And this is a typical, uh, recently attackers uh, uh, utilize vulnerabilities of the uh, 
infrastructure, security infrastructure itself, that is a patch management system. So, uh, attacker uses a vulnerabilities of the patch management systems and then uh, some malware are impacted into a, uh, organizations, victims uh, organizations uh, computers. So that is a, we believe that this is a kind of the APT, uh, advanced persistent stress. So this is a first, we believe the first massive, uh, these are sort of, uh, APT attacks happens on March 20, 2013. So we call 320 cyber attacks. Actually three major banks and three major Korean broadcast <laughs> company, including KBS and the NBC are targeted and also uh, they utilize a APT, Advanced Persistent Attack, and a, they utilize a Morias uh, to dis disrupt a uh, infrastructure, and also they utilize a patch management systems uh, actually uh, operating in uh, victims' networks. And so the objective of the, uh, this uh, attack is to uh, this was a national uh, social and economic systems in Korea. So we sus suspect uh, the source of this uh, attack comes from North Korea. And this is a information security governance in Korea and KISA. So KISA is a Korea internet security agencies. So a, a play, act, active play, play, have a active roles in, to play in protecting Korean cyberspace. Actually, we have a uh, Korean presidential uh, office here. So cyberspace has been divided into three parts, public cyberspace, private cyberspace, and defense. So all relevant to uh, this government uh, ministry has said there are unique roles to defend their own. Uh, actually, uh, to put to depend uh, private uh, sectors, MSIP, uh, Ministry of the uh, Science, ICT, and Future Planning is responsible for. Uh, under the Minister M MSIP, there is a KISA, Korea Internet Security Agency, actually has a uh, unique role in defending Korean uh, uh, cyberspace from attacks. Actually, uh, uh, we have some those rules. So uh, that rules a uh, ask uh, some private sector to provide a uh, some uh, traffic information, static information, uh, to coordinate a uh, massive DDoS attack, network level DDoS attack. So uh, so IP service providers and smartphone users and those hotels, commercial companies. Uh, cooperating in to pre prevent uh, this uh, cyber attacks. And actually, let me briefly introduce KISA. KISA is, uh, was uh, established to create a safe uh, environment. Actually, in 2009, there was a former KISA organization, but it reorganized uh, uh, on uh, 2009, uh, July. The main objective is to three roles. Among them, first role is very important, is that it to uh, prevent a cyberspace, private cyberspace, uh, providing a guidelines and uh, providing a operational services uh, to the cooperate with the other relevant internet service providers and also other uh, stakeholders in Korea. We have rules that is uh, based on the act on promotion of the information and communication that utilization and the information protection, etc. So actually uh, all act cybersecurity uh, response actions work works will be coordinated by the Korean uh, President's Office and Center. There is a KISA, Korea Internet uh, Security Center, uh, will coordinate with, uh, by, by 
uh, sharing information with relevant uh, government organization and with uh, sharing information with uh, uh, ISP. We have three major internet service providers, KT, SK Broadband, and LGU Plus. And also we have uh, uh, international uh, uh, relationships, uh, for, for example, FIRST and AP Third and Microsoft itself. And we have local, local antivirus companies, so we will cooperate and sharing information to prevent our, our space. And KISAS has a uh, 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 one has a three divisions and one centers and eleven teams and number of part participants uh, work is so around one sixty one hundred sixty so ma major role uh, actually uh, this is part of the uh, KISA so KISA has a Korea Internet Security Center so Korea's internet sector has a rules uh, on internet instance response and internet instance analysis and infrastructure protection and cybersecurity training and certification. So that is a major role uh, under the of the Korea Internet Security Centers. And activities we operate a twenty four. Uh, seven hours uh, monitoring uh, services and for preventing monitoring and we have a some detection measures uh, for such as a malware and DDoS attacks and uh, finding a vulnerability of the uh, software and applications. We have analyze, analyze uh, tools uh, to analyze a malwares collected by and shared by uh, organizations, relevant organizations. We have a response recovery teams and also we have a corporations with other uh, international uh, cyber security relevance organizations, example, a sort. And uh, our goal is to read the global uh, corporations. So we have a third organization and we establish a cyber threat intelligence networks, uh, including, uh, uh, including a local antivirus company as also global company like this. And we establish a cyber alliance for multi mutual progress called CAMP. So, member of this uh, uh, alliance includes a uh, ministries and government bodies and non-profit organizations. Currently, uh, 47 organizations from 35 countries. Actually, I would like to briefly introduce uh, some best practice. Actually, we have a, as you know, uh, currently we have a uh, serious uh, issues, so-called drive-by uh, download attacks. So we need to have a some websites having a malware which can be used as a drive-by download. So we have a some searching functions in KISA. So we call uh, malicious code finders and then check more than millions of websites for infection of the malware. And then after then after we uh, 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 find that malicious code, we inform administrator of the website to remove the malware, the DSA main operations. And then we have a online disinfection systems. So if some users has a, a some malware uh, actually in their personal computers and then we visit a KISAS website and then uh, we add, uh, use uh, PISA provide a, some very specialized antivirus programs that only uh, that, uh, uh, only uh, cures curing that uh, malaria. So this is a on, we call online malaria disinfection systems which is operated in by the KISA. And we also have a DDoS shelter systems. Actually, we have a two types of the measures for DDoS attacks. First one is a network level 
uh, DDoS systems, and also second one is a kind of the host devs. So Kisa provide a, a DDoS shelter systems for only for small and medium comp companies, not a, not include a large companies. So that is a main objective. So Kisa provide a the kind of the uh, DDoS shelter systems to the small and medium because small and medium enterprise has a limited capability to prevent a DDoS attack, that is main objectives. And also we have a bot uh, response systems, we call DDoS sync systems. So if some uh, computers, computers are actually impacted by malware and would like to connect to content and control servers in the internet. So uh, actually uh, they would like to ask a uh, IP, Address of the DNS, DNS uh, that uh, both impacted the uh, command and control servers. So in that case, is uh, that uh, communication is uh, directed to the uh, Kisa's Haninet systems to analyze the DDoS attack. So that is a main object. So we operate a DDoS uh, uh, DNS sync systems to prevent a both, both impacted computers. And as I said, there is a several uh, measures to uh, DDoS attack. First one is a a uh, network level DDoS attack prevention system, and second one is a host level, and third one is a to uh, remove malware in the user's computer. That is a three level. So we currently operate three level uh, measures for preventing a DDoS attack and disbanding DDoS attacks. And we also have a online but impacted checking system. So this is uh, if you visit a uh, some Kisa's website and then uh, check if their computer user's computer is impacted uh, by net or not. So if that uh, computer is uh, uh, impacted, in the case is uh, some specialized uh, antivirus. Uh, program will be downloaded to the PDP, uh, user's computers and then removed uh, the uh, malware. That is the main operation. And then international security standard activities. Actually, we have uh, TTA, telecommunication uh, uh, standard organization in Korea. So actually, uh, MSIP is sponsoring TTA activities. So TTA develop a TTA standard in the ICT area, including information security. So there is a one technical command, TC5, is responsible for the developing TTA standard in the area of information security. So there are several uh, contributors, organizations to submitting a contributions to make a, actually we have a good relationship with IETF, so we, have, we sometimes use a IETF RFC uh, documents to make a TTA uh, uh, standard. And this is the organization stage, the structure of TTA, so we have uh, six technical committee, telecom te technical committee two on telecommunication, technical four ICT convergence, and technical five information security, and technical six soft 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 content, and technical A broadcasting, technical line radio, audio, mobile communications. <laughs> So TC5 is responsible for developing a TTA standard that is a uh, domestic uh, standard in the area of the ICTs. It's, 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 uh, TTA, TC5 is responsible for the uh, developing a uh, TTA standard in the area of security, information security. So there are five project groups under the TC5. So this is five. Uh, TC5, TC so P, uh, PG, we call PG501. PG means the project groups. So PG, project group 501 on information security infrastructure. And project group 502, personal information protection and identity management. And PG, uh, PG503, cybersecurity. And PG504, 
application security and evaluation and assessment. And PG505 is on uh, biometrics. So you, you, when you think these five projects, we are now uh, developing a uh, uh, information security relevance uh, TTA standard. Actually, we have a, some uh, committee uh, for international standard organization, for example, Korea uh, Mira Committee SCG SG17. Actually, I'm chair of this uh, Mira Committee chair, and we have a Korea SC27 JTC1 committee, and we also have a SC37 committee. So actually, the main role of this Mira Committee is to submit a, a contribution to the uh, relevant. Uh, uh, standard developer organization, including uh, ITUT study group 17 and the JTC1 SC27 and also JTC1 SC37. So, and then if you look at uh, this committee, actually Korea ITUT study group 17 media committee organized by, uh, coordinated by the TTA and the RLA is government organizations and actually uh, all uh, contributions and uh, uh, to the uh, ITUT study group 17 are coordinated with this media committee. <coughs> and also we have uh, Korea SC27 media committee, and same nose, and then different organizations to the ITC1 SC27. So, and we have Korea Privacy Security Forum, which was established in 2016, this May, so sponsored by TTA and MSIP. So, and so actually this forum is supported by many uh, uh, government organizations and also our forum is objective is to contribute to the uh, work for the international uh, standardization, including IETF and the ITO and JTC1. Thank you. That's all. Any questions? <laughs> Thank you, Professor Yum. We do have um, at least another five minutes if the folks do have questions. All right. Um, so th I guess thank you very much. Okay, thank you. And let's see, the next talk is on uh, crypto conditions. Adrian Hope Bell. Hopefully, I said that correctly. Crypto conditions. Yep. Yep. Warren's pulling them up. Do you want the cookie thing? Right, hi. Um, so, myself and some colleagues um, had a boff in Berlin on the Interledger protocol. Um, I think some people here attended that. Um, crypto conditions is uh, a piece of that work that we developed. It's an essential component of the Interledger work. Um, Crypto conditions is basically a, a standard for composing uh, signatures out of you know, composable pieces. Um, there's a bunch of features here which were requirements um, for Interledger, um, but we think that the the scheme is, is useful beyond what we use it for in, in Interledger protocol. It's um, it's intended to be very minimal, very uh, um, uh, straightforward to use um, where we use existing crypto primitives like signature existing signature schemes um, we uh, specify exactly which parameters to use uh, as an example it's obviously it's composable so I'll get into details of how that works um, it's designed to be extensible so we've defined a few um, uh, types to start with but but you can it, it's uh, the the 
encoding scheme allows that to expand. Um, and it's quite efficient. So you'll see the, the conditions themselves um, are all a relatively small size because we use Merkle circuits um, to, to produce a fingerprint for the whole Compose signature. Um, very quickly, just two slides on the, the background. So the way Interledger protocol works is it uses these conditions as effectively a distributed trigger. Uh, you have a bunch of ledgers out there which have a transaction queued um, waiting to be executed. And all of those transactions are queued pending fulfillment of a specific condition. Um, and, and either that condition is fulfilled or, or it times out and the, the transaction executes or rolls back. Um, so that's the sort of high level view of, of what we what we needed out of um, crypto conditions. Um, in the blockchain space, um, the word smart contract is used a lot. Um, so, so really, I guess what we were looking for was a smart contract. Um, but effectively, we needed a way to describe to a ledger uh, some condition um, that needed to be fulfilled for that ledger to, to execute the, the transaction. This is a financial transaction when we're talking about ledgers, but really it could be any distributed system that has some sort of um, prepare and commit, two-phase commit um, protocol. So, so we looked at simple signatures, uh, straightforward existing signature schemes. Um, they didn't really meet all of the requirements we needed because we needed the ability to do things like multi-sig. Um, Multi-sig itself, uh, we, none of the standards that exist for defining multi-sig um, really footed the bill. Um, and then right on the other end of the, the spectrum, we could have gone for a full sort of Turing complete programming language like other uh, sort of smart contract systems like Ethereum have done where, where you can actually provide a piece of code that executes and comes out with a you know true or false, this is fulfilled or not. Um, we ended up um, uh, settling for something in the middle, and, and that's because Interledger has some quite specific feature requirements. Um, those two gray circles are, are ledgers um, in, in this diagram, and, and the, those are conditions um, uh, above them. And what's important when you're setting up a financial transaction in this way is, is, is that the outcome is both um, determin deterministic across all ledgers and, and predictable up front. So a ledger needs to know um, needs to know when it receives the condition that it will be able to evaluate the fulfillment when the fulfillment comes. So when it gets the trigger to release the transaction, it doesn't help if some ledgers receive the interpret that trigger and other ledgers see the trigger and actually can't interpret it because it's too big or it uses a underlying cryptographic algorithm they don't understand or something like that so so we needed some metadata attached to the condition um, that describes some of those things uh, and when i get into the format i'll explain how we've done that so so we we settle on something somewhere in the middle there it's 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 a little bit more more than a multi-sig, so as I said, it has some, some additional features, but it's not a full programming language because we needed that absolute deterministic nature, even if the system's interpreting the conditions run on completely different stacks. Um, and, and we rely here on the deterministic nature of the underlying crypto primitives, so signature and hash algorithms. Uh, what we do is we define a bunch of types, um, so, so different uh, types that are used in the system, either basic signatures, so you know you you evaluate them according to a normal signature scheme algorithm. I have a public key, I have a signature, I have a message. Is the signature valid? Yes or no? Um, and then we have types uh, which are thresholds. So so this type has a number, um, let's say two, uh, and it contains three uh, signatures. And if two of those three are valid, then the outcome is true, or th then the, the threshold uh, condition is fulfilled. But in order to make this uh, a little bit more flexible, we basically took the simple signatures and hashes, and we uh, packaged them in the same way as the threshold um, uh, types. So, so the, the API or the, the encoding format looks the same for all of them, and that allows you to embed uh, compound signatures within compound signatures, so you can compose quite a complex tree um, out of these out of these uh, pieces. 
what you end up with is the ability to to build something like that, uh, effectively a Boolean uh, threshold circuit where where each of the logic gates is uh, is a crypto condition or, or a signature, a, a hash, something like that. So so you can see in this instance, um, the circuit is the result of two of the three signatures at the top. Let's assume Chandra, Lena, and Bob each are providing a signature. If two out of those three is provided, then that gate is true, in which case the overall signature is true because the gate below requires either milli or the, the compound one above. <laughs> So you can see how then you can you can build up some quite interesting scenarios. An example is this one where, for example, you have three bank employees. Two of the three need to provide a, a, a key to to fulfill a condition, or there's some sort of security override um, that that could also uh, provide a, a, a key. Um, part of the re rationale for bringing this to IETF is that there has been, a, there is an existing call for standardization in the space. Um, Christopher Allen and Shannon Applecline are involved in an identity um, identity work, specifically at uh, the UN and the UN's ID2020 initiative, uh, where they wrote a paper called Smart Signatures, um, calling for a standardization around something like this, effectively a signature scheme that was a little smarter than existing schemes, but presented a similar API, so a similar, um, a similar uh, algorithm for validation. Give me a, a, a key, a publicly shareable piece, give me a, a message, and then validate the signature, true or false. Um, the draft uh, that exists today is in its second rev. Um, there is a, a, a new rev, um, which is a fairly significant upgrade on this one. I'm afraid it wasn't ready in time to share. Mostly just changes to explanations and a lot more um, uh, descriptive language around why we've done this work and, and, and how you might use it in other use cases. Um, Specifically, what the draft describes is the uh, the formats. So there's there's uh, we've used ASN one to describe the encoding. Um, canonical encoding is binary. Uh, we've um, gone for OER as the um, encoding for encoding rules. Uh, we thought it was uh, a better bet than DR or BR or or any of the others um, for a variety of reasons. One of the big things that is changing um, or that is proposed to change is that rather than having an enumerated set of types, um, there will still be a, an eye on a list of types with numbers, but uh, it won't be, uh, the type will just be a, a, a bit uh, string. And rather than the feature bit mask, there will be a subtypes um, subtypes bit mask, uh, bit map actually. And it's it's not a bit mask, it's a bit map. Um, so I apologize for the confusion there. Uh, and what that is is for the compound, um, why that's important, for the compound types, um, you need to understand from the condition what uh, are the types of any um, conditions that may be embedded in there. And that's for that upfront evaluation if I receive a compound, the, a, a compound condition um, type, and inside there is, for example, a simple signature that uses ED25519, and I'm not able to um, to evaluate ED25519 signatures, I should reject this upfront. I shouldn't take that condition, tee up the transaction, and forward it on, um, because when it comes time to evaluate it, and I unpack that compound fulfillment, I'm gonna find a ED25519 signature, and then I'm not gonna know what to do with it, uh, which even though the signature is valid, means I'm probably gonna roll back that transaction and somebody else isn't, which, which breaks the protocol. Uh, the fulfillment is is a little simpler. It has the type indicator and then a payload. The payload's obviously different depending on the type. So that's an example of the ED25519 fulfillment. It's the public key and signature. Um, sorry, I'm gonna go back one slide. The fingerprint here is important to note. So in the condition, what that fingerprint is, is a unique identifier for, um, for the condition. Uh, in the example of, for example, that ED25519, that would just be the public key. Um, but for something like a compound uh, type, like the threshold or the, the prefix type, um, that would actually be the result of this Merkle circuit of the other condition fingerprints. Um, and I'll explain that in a second as well. 
Um, where we see uh, crypto conditions is potentially useful as a drop-in replacement for existing signature schemes where uh, the condition uh, is the publicly shareable piece similar to a public key. Uh, the signature is the actual fulfillment of that condition. So, so that would be all of the data required to evaluate whether uh, the fulfillment is, is valid. And then you can still provide a message. So um, that could be something contextual. So in our case, for example, uh, you could define a, a, a high level, higher level protocol within the interledger protocol that says the message is derived from some sort of transaction data. Uh, and what's important there is that the condition can be derived without the message. So the condition is always something that you derive from the public keys of the internal pieces. Uh, there's no need for the signatures uh, upfront to do that. Uh, we, in this uh, initial version, have defined these five types. So there's a pre-image type, which is very basic, uh, effectively a hash lock. Um, what that is, is that the condition is just the hash and the uh, fulfillment is just the pre-image itself. Uh, so the message is completely ignored. So you would use this in use cases where there is no message uh, required. So fulfillment of that condition is simply providing the pre-image. It's a, it's a one-off uh, one signature effectively. Uh, we've defined an RSA and an ED25519 type. Um, so those are the three simple types. For RSA, um, we're using PSS uh, and we have um, and, and uh, what are the other parameters? All based on SHA-256. Um, so these types, other than ED25519, all use SHA-256 as the uh, fingerprint hashing algorithm. Um, if you wanted to introduce a different hashing algorithm or a larger hash si digest size or whatever, you would just introduce a new type. So actually, I've made a mistake here. The, the, the name of the types are pre-image SHA-256, RSA SHA-256, ED25519 is just ED25519 because we don't actually hash the public key for the fingerprint. It's already the same size. It's, a, it's, it's usable as it is. Um, and the same with uh, prefix and threshold. So prefix and threshold are the only compound conditions we've defined so far. Um, I'll go into a bit of detail what prefix is in a second, but threshold is effectively a um, set of subconditions and a threshold. So uh, what you would do is, let's say for a two of three signature scheme, you would take, let's say three RSA simple conditions, um, put them together, and, and you would come up with a, and, and you'd pack them according to the, the format for a, th a threshold condition, and you'd specify two as the threshold. Um, now, when someone provides a fulfillment for that, they would provide two ful fulfillments for two of those conditions, at least, and then they can just provide the actual condition again for one of them. So they only actually have to provide the fulfillment for two, and when you evaluate that, you evaluate that two of the fulfillments are valid, and that is equal to or greater than the threshold. Um, as I mentioned, we use Merkle circuits um, for the conditions. The, this is the fingerprint. So um, basically what that means is you, you in, a, in a threshold condition, uh, you can provide conditions instead of fulfillment. So, you, so an unfulfilled condition um, where, you, where you don't need to meet the, the where, where you have two out of the three. Um, and, and the result is that um, you always generate the same fixed size fingerprint um, no matter which fulfillments and conditions you have. So you have different combinations of conditions and fulfillments, you get a deterministic algorithm for producing the overall fingerprint. And that's important when you're validating the fulfillment. Um, final comment, two, two comments. Uh, max fulfillment length is also something that's provided with a condition. And that's important to ensure when you see a condition that you feel like your system is going to be able to process the fulfillment that you're not going to receive, um, you know, masses of, of, of very big signatures that maybe um, in, a, in a resource constrained environment would be problematic. Um, I've kind of explained that slide, the same, same issue. Um, 
So the, the last thing is then the prefix conditions. Prefix condition is a compound type, but really all it is is wrapping an existing condition with a prefix so that when you evaluate it, you apply the prefix to the message before you validate the internal signatures. Uh, and that's useful for basically namespacing um, namespacing uh, a, a condition. So uh, you can reuse a PKI pair, for example, when there is no message. So in a context where the message is always empty, um, you would only be able to use that key pair once. There's some related work here, um, which are in the slides, if anyone's interested in having a look at. None of those met the requirements we had, most specifically the ability to produce this key that is a, sort of looks the same, no matter how complex or simple the underlying um, underlying signature uh, is going to be um, and, and a bunch of other related work that we've um, that we've used or referenced um, that, that are worth looking at uh, in terms of implementations that's where they stand there's Python JavaScript go and Java implementations um, Java and go are not entirely feature complete um, in terms of possible future extensions, obviously we'd like to support a bunch of additional signature algorithms or, or even um, digest algorithms. Uh, so we only have a few at the moment and those met the requirements we have. Um, and these are the open questions that, that we still need to answer. Um, so the first one we've proposed a change to what's there, but I, I'd be interested to hear what people think of that. Um, also in terms of uh, elliptic curve, uh, we've gone with ED25519. Is that a good or bad decision or should we just do both? Um, then when we were here, when we had IETF in Berlin, we had a lot of comments around CBOR and whether we should rather use CBOR as our encoding format rather than ASN1 and OER. So I'd be interested to hear that. And then whether this has all the right ingredients to potentially be a standards track work at IETF. Uh, and that is it, sorry, that is the proposed new binary encoding. As you can see, type and subtypes with fingerprint and fulfillment length. And that is it. There, there is a mailing list, an interledger mailing list, um, which uh, we're using at ITF. Um, anything else? Thank you, Adrian. Any questions? Okay. Oh, okay. Do. Hi, Sean Turner. Um, hey, I love the way you, your presentation style, by the way. It's like 35 slides, which is not a wall of words. Um, I guess I went to the BOF last time, and I guess I remember there was the question about um, the encoding scheme and whether it should go CBOR. Um, your statement about it being a drop-in kind of isn't really true, though, right, since everybody else uses DER. So the different thing, it's kind of like, I don't know, maybe the encoding choice might be a barrier of entry. I don't know if you've had any kind of experience with changing it, like does it actually affect people picking it up or do you think that the, the code you've got developed is, is good enough to get it out there and get going? Uh, okay, so the closest experience we have is I've been working on the Java implementation and I've tried to uh, emulate the JCE, the crypto extensions sort of style. Um, it's doable. Um, when I say drop-in replacement, I don't really mean yeah, sort of data for data, but but more that the API is the same. You you have a public piece, you have a message, you have a signature. Um, so it's described as ASN one now. We could just switch to saying okay, canonical encoding is DER. I guess if if that's advice that sort of everyone thinks. I'm I'm a reformed fine. ASN one fanboy, so I'm not suggesting that. I'm just saying. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> cool. Hey, Wendy. Relaying for uh, Stephen Farrell from the Jabber Room, uh, who wondered, uh, could you say a bit more about what's changed since the uh, BOF in Berlin? Um, wow. The, what has changed since the BOF in Berlin? More implementation experience? Um, I can't off the top of my head, to be honest. The, the, in terms of the spec itself, we revved the spec to make it more clear, but I don't think much has changed in terms of the technical detail. Um, so between 00 and 01, it's mostly uh, textual stuff around how it works um, and some bugs, but that's it. Hi, uh, do we say names here? Rich Sauls. Um, so if I understand what you've got is a thin sort of algebraic tree layer around existing signatures and you add a new type which is a digest which can be 
any one you want as long as it's the color black, right? Um, but you turn all of those signature types into octet strings. I'm wondering, since most of the signature types are often pre-identified, why don't you just come up with an algebraic tree to map your language and then just use the signatures natively? Um, so the, I guess we, we needed a uniform format that was quite simple. So, so it's defined as an octet string there. What that string is, um, I don't know if well, I had that there. So, 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 so when you compute the condition, you basically, depending on the type, it's going to be different things. So it's a hash of, in the RSA case, of the key, public key. In the uh, pre-image case, it's the hash of the pre-image. In the case of a threshold, it's the hash of the concatenation of the sub-conditions. So it's, it's, there's different inputs each time. Um, that's yeah, one of the reasons. Well, unions are kind of a solved problem already in the ASO one thing. I just uh, it, it, we can go. I, I mean, I would like to understand just, in more detail what that would look like. What you're proposing? Um, I, I mean, I'm. Uh, I need to find by. I'm not sure I'm actually proposing anything. But in terms of getting use and deployment in existing libraries, the fact that you take a well-known, complicated data structure that has had like an RSA signature that we've had lots of problems with getting right, right? PKCS1 versus PSS. And then you just turn it into a octet string. Um, I so, so we've done that by saying, I know all those parameters are hard coded. There, there's a standard, uh, there, there's a set for, for this type. This is the exponent you must use. And this is the, yeah, the, the masking we, algorithm in this. So, so we have this phrase in the ITF, crypto agility. So don't, if you want to use different variations, then you just define a different type number. Yeah, but we've already got all of that in using the types natively. So you may want to, I suggest you reconsider. That's all. You know, just I hear what you're saying. That the challenge is the the upfront evaluation and saying. Um, just well, that's your shim. That's your wrapper layer. The, the envelope, around. right? That's yeah. your wrapper layer that you put around the existing legacy style signatures. Mm -hmm. They're different for different signature schemes. Uh huh. And yep. and and we need something uniform. That's kind of the challenge. I it, 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 think of it as a. It's like an envelope with a number that says inside here is an RSA signature with these with these yeah. parameters. And, and if it's a different number, it's an RSA signature uh, with these parameters. And uh huh. So it's it's just it's it's kind of enumerating all those combinations. I, I don't understand why you're seeing that as a big deal. It's no, no, I'm, I'm not. I'm, I'm asking why. Uh, I'm not sure if I understand what the. So ask it's is. a union, right? It can be one of this signature, this, this, this type, this type, this type, or this type. Mm -hmm. And there are constructs in almost any data definition language you want to use. Let's say ASN one. Any defined by where you know you have an identifier at the beginning that's a short prefix OID, and then it's an RSA signature or it's an EDDSA signature or it's a, you know. Um, Goldilocks 448 signature, whatever it is. And I don't think the way to limit the choices, I think that's got two problems. One, it takes these data sectors sections and at your layer completely hides what the values are, which I think is bad as an implementation and bad for security analysis. Um, and then two, it actually limits you. Now, maybe you can define a profile that says we only want these kinds of things, but I just think taking the, the long history of signatures. So, so I, I'm just trying to understand the suggestion. Is the suggestion to use OIDs? The or, suggestion or, as is whatever to, you need to do to turn the signature and the key value into being the actual existing defined ASN1 structures for those signatures and those key values. <laughs> and then you figure out what you have to do to enable that. That's, what the that's the suggestion. And there's a number of techniques depending on what you want to use. I'm going to ask you for some help understanding that in more detail. Okay. All right. But that's Thank fine. You. Thank you for your cool. talk. Thanks. All right. So next up, um, we'll have uh, Alan DeCock um, for the DHCP 8021X. I didn't see Alan, though. There. Is there an Alan in the house? Wendy, can you just ask Stephen, is, is there someone else speaking for Alan that I'm not aware of? Maybe he was aware of? I don't think I've seen Alan. 
Yeah, so I don't even see him in the room. Yeah, I thought he was remote, but I should we, wasn't. Should we reorder and come back to him? Sure, we could do that. Um, so next we have Fernando Gant for I, the numeric IDs. And I guess if anyone has a way to reach Alan on, you know, Jabber or similar. Thank you. My network isn't working hey. still, so. Yep. Yes. Uh, okay. yep. Thank you. So my name is uh, Fernando Gont, and I'll be presenting a couple of ideas that uh, we had presented at the ITF meeting in Buenos Aires about the um, security and privacy implications of uh, transit, uh, transient numeric identifiers using network protocols. Uh, as a brief introduction, what are these numeric identifiers? They are data objects that are used in different particle specifications to unique, uh, uniquely uh, distinguish among objects. Um, what we tried to do was a kind of background here um, is we looked at problems that we use, uh, that we found at identifiers in different protocols from different layers. And we tried to come up with a solution, like a general solution to avoid problems in the future for these identifiers and others. So while looking at uh, numeric identifiers, we uh, found that usually they have uh, uh, specific properties that are required from uh, an interoperability point of view. Uh, in some cases, it's uniqueness. There are other identifiers that are required to be monotonically, monotonically increasing. There are others that are required to be stable within some sort of, of context. And associated with those identifiers, there's like a failure severity, severity. or put another way, uh, uh, what can go wrong or how wrong things can go if you fail to actually comply with those properties. Uh, what are the issues associated with these numeric identifiers? Um, if you look back into um, history of different identifiers and different protocols, uh, we got them wrong for different kinds of identifiers in different protocols. There have been issues with predictable um, TCP initial seconds numbers, issues with predictable uh, ephemeral port numbers, issues with predictable IPv6 uh, um, interface identifiers, uh, same thing with fragment identifiers, same thing with DNS transaction IDs. So uh, while looking at all these issues, which if you look back into history, these days back to that paper published by Morris in the early 80s, right? And all of these issues have been repeated for different kind of identifiers in different protocols. Problem is, you know, essentially the same, but the, unfortunately, different, uh, you know, specifications of different protocols, you know, uh, uh, essentially fail in, in, in the same way. Uh, in some cases, what you find is that, uh, well, first of all, it took so many years to actually fix the problem. Um, just to give you an idea, with TCP initial seconds number, the paper by Morris was in the early 80s, and we got to uh, formally fix this uh, a few years ago when it comes to ISNs. Uh, so the idea is to, you know, reduce the amount of time that it takes to get this fixed and also to prevent uh, other identifiers in other protocols to, you know, uh, suffer from the same problems. So uh, when trying to analyze, you know, uh, why we have these kind of problems, we came up with, you know, three different reasons for which, you know, a number of protocols have these problems. Um, one of them is that uh, a number of protocol specifications under specify uh, their identifiers. So um, they don't require like any properties, like, you know, this should be unpredictable. Uh, that's the case, or that was the case with DNS transaction IDs or the, the ephemeral port numbers in, in, in transport protocols. Uh, there are other specifications that over specify the identifiers, uh, meaning that, for example, in the, for the fragment ID, uh, the, spe the specification suggests that it has to be a global counter. So is the spec suggesting that you end up with predictable numbers? And obviously there are other cases in which, you know, the spec does the right thing, but the implementation just, you know, failed to do what it's supposed to do. Um, so what have uh, we been doing in this area? Um, 
at the ITF meeting in Buenos Aires, we uh, presented the document that is in the first bullet. Uh, that document was meant to do like a bunch of things at the same time. Uh, on one hand, it, pro it was providing um, the timeline for you know what happened with different identifiers. And I think that uh, what we tried to you know show with those sample timelines, uh, first of all, was how long it took to actually get the problems fixed. Uh, in some cases, it was something like 20 years, in others, around 30 years. Um, it was also interesting to see how, you know, uh, a problem phone in one protocol uh, was extremely similar to a problem phone in a different protocol, but uh, things fixed in one protocol didn't affect at all what happened in a different protocol, okay? So, for example, we fixed it how the IDs are generated for fragment identifiers in IPv4, but that didn't affect how we generated the fragment IDs in IPv6, okay? Um, then what we try to do is, I mean, not just, you know, try to spot, uh, uh, let's say, identifiers in, in protocols that had these problems, but actually try to do something to prevent the same thing from happening in the future. So, um, what we did was we tried to you know do an analysis of um, of the type of identifiers that are are needed, and we came up with a number of categories so that if you are specifying a, a new uh, you know a new protocol, uh, it's quite likely that you know you are using a type of identifier that has been used for a different protocol, so you don't you know you know you don't need to you know rethink the way in which you generate those identifiers. And then in that document, we um, also, at the time, were uh, proposing to update the RFC, I don't remember what, uh, uh, 3552 bis, uh, with recommendations on, on how to, um, or uh, with recommendations or additional recommendations on, on uh, what to do in security considerations when you were writing a new document. Uh, that is like doing a specific analysis of the IDs that you were using. Um, since the ITF meeting in Buenos Aires, uh, uh, we split that original document uh, upon request of you know a number of people. So we came up with these three documents. Uh, the first one is the document that has the timeline uh, for uh, different identifiers. Uh, in the current version of the ID, we have included uh, timelines for IPv6 interface IDs, uh, TCP initial second numbers, uh, fragmentation IDs, and we are working to add a few more like um, ephemeral port numbers, NFS file handles, and DNS transaction IDs, okay? Uh, this was in response to some folks from the working group that I mentioned that it would be great if we could have examples of, uh, you know, this kind of problems, but in different layers. So we have, you know, examples from the transport layer, examples from the internet layer, but for example, we were missing examples from the application layer. And that's, for example, where the NFS uh, file handles is supposed to address. The second document on uh, numeric IDs uh, generation, that's the document that uh, tries to um, provide advice as opposed to be just, you know, merely in informative. Uh, we um, added a lot of clarifications uh, thanks to the, um, to the feedback that we got uh, from a number of people. And uh, what we are uh, working right now is uh, well to you know, uh, obviously improve the, the current ID, but also to uh, provide a more elaborate discussion on the reuse of identifiers in different layers. Uh, in the current version of the ID, this one, um, we do have some discussion about that, but only when it comes to the reuse of MAC addresses in IPv6 interface identifiers. But there are other examples uh, um, yeah, when it comes to the reuse of identifiers in different layers. This last document has been dropped. I mean, we are mentioning it here because, well, it was one of the spin-off documents from the original one, but we are uh, we dropped that one. Uh, the plan is to uh, discuss the, you know, the, the, the paragraph or so that there was in that text uh, to be considered for adding for 30, uh, 3552Bs. I, I guess that's, you know, part of the possible uh, updates to 3552Bs. So that's uh, basically the update on what we did. I don't know if there are any questions.
Yes. Hi, uh, Juan Carlos Zuniga. Thanks. Uh, could you go back one, one slide, please? Fernando? Yes. Yes. So, um, thanks. I think this uh, the split is is helping understand. You've done a, a lot of very good work, and uh, it was hard to to digest when it was all all uh, put together. I think that's that's a, a very good uh, step. I've also heard a number of comments about you know different pieces of the of the document. My comment goes about the the, the actual split that you've done. Uh huh. I. I I think that, uh, especially regarding the first two parts, there's there's mainly two big uh, pieces of of, uh, of information. One is uh, educational and information, and you've digested and, and analyzed, and, and I think that that is great. The second one is on the on the advice mm -hmm. and and the proposed proposed uh, solutions. Uh -huh. So to me, the split is is uh, would probably best would be best if we if we kept that split in that way because then then it's you have one document that is actually infor informing, educating people, and, and doing very good work on, on, on all this analysis that you've done. And then uh, there's another document that we can discuss uh, separately on, on what to do. Uh, to me, the, the cate categorization of numeric IDs is probably belonging to the, to the educational part or the informa informative part. I know it's, it's not a, an easy split. It's not just like copy this section and put it there because there's, there's of course, editorial work to be done. Mm -hmm. But I think that will be a cleaner separation of, of the work and an easier way for people to digest and use it. For instance, uh, one, one piece here that we can take on different protocols and even beyond the ETF, let's say in IEEE. Huh? And the other one we can discuss specifically, okay, what, what are the advice on, on, on how to use these uh, identifiers and algorithms and stuff? Uh, okay, so um, 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 comment into that. First of all, if you are willing to help us, you're welcome. Uh, so that's the first thing. Um, and the other thing is that uh, in our document, um, we do two things. So uh, in, in the, this document in the middle, right? So on one hand, we uh, define different categories, you know, based on the requirements and the failure severity. I think that's something that, I mean, based on what you're saying, you probably, uh, you know, keep here. What we have, what we also have in, in that document is when it comes to the sample identifiers that, you know, we are analyzing, we also mention in which category each of those fall, okay? So that's probably a part that we could, let's say, move out of this document. The, but when it comes to the definition of, of the categories, um, the reason for which we kept it here is that, let's say that you are specifying a new protocol and you say, okay, well, my requirements is that I need some sort of ID, for example, in which the ID needs to be unique, but things fail really bad if uh, I don't get that uniqueness. So it's like if there's a collision of IDs, right? So you need to, you know, figure out which is the category for the ID that that uh, that uh, you need, so that you know which of the algorithms you should use. That that's essentially the idea. But I I, I agree that this document has two things. So on one uh, on one hand, it does specify the categories, which is something that yes, I I, I probably keep it here. The other thing is that probably for this document. We don't really need to say, well, uh, in which category does the fragment ID fall or in which category does this other ID fall? Uh, we provide that as examples, uh, you know, to, you know, for people that read the document to see, okay, well, now I understand. So the fragment ID has these properties. So that's why it falls into this category. And that's why I should use this algorithm. But uh, I mean, this was like a, a first step into splitting the document. So it's not that, uh, you know, we want to stick to this structure of the document. It was a first step. So I, I'm, I'm happy to work with you further to, you know, to improve this. And if there's stuff that needs to be taken out from one document and moved to another, that's, that's perfectly fine. Okay, so I'll take a look and I'll, I'll give you comments. Then. Perfect. Thank you. Paul Hoffman, I have still a fairly significant issue with the generation document, mm -hmm. which is that you use random parent parent throughout as a way of doing this. Um, many of the things that you're talking about actually need to be running at extremely high speed. Um, the random function on different operating systems, different languages has a widely varying um, profile of speeds. Um, the amount of randomness that you need uh, might be more or less, such like that. And unfortunately, historically, um, we've done a really bad job here 
in the IETF of telling uh, operating system vendors and or operating system developers, language developers about less need for high quality random. Um, Don Eastlake has an FNV draft that still hasn't finished. Don, I'm kicking you a bit on that one, as I do once a year. Um, but there are there are uh, much more efficient ways of getting randomness and mixing. And, and really, all you need is the mixing function, not the, the mashing function for this. Um, but just saying, just do random here, um, I think is not the answer for a lot of these things. Because if you are having to, say, generate um, IPv4 header things very, very rapidly, um, and you just are pulling in your normal random function, you could be going way slower on that one thing. It might even be very important that you do that, mm -hmm. but there are fast random um, or fast mixers and slow mixers. So I think that you need to discuss that a lot more um, because you can't just assume random is random is random from a speed point of view. Some of them might be better or worse, let's not worry about that, um, but just from a speed point of view, and that's I think critical to having people use this. So just to double check if I got your comment right. So your concern is that when we use random in the document, that might be mapped to the function that the OS is using, which yeah, you we don't have know. that in your pseudocode. Okay. Uh, so what if we were either to change the name of the function that we use there and then specify what we mean with that function and you know provide a a more thorough discussion of, of what goes on inside. You can do that, but the discussion has to be about speed. I mean, it, some of it has to be about, is it a good random function? But, you know, it's 2016. Most of them are, are at least okay for what you need. Uh -huh. But speed is critical here because if somebody looks at this, implements it, say it says, oh, I need to start putting random in here. And all of a sudden, the performance of generating new packets goes to hell. They're just going to pull it out. I think what you need is a discussion of saying, um, if you can't use your, you know, the easiest random number generator you have, come up with a better one and, and have some discussions. And we don't, unfortunately, we don't have advice for them on that. Um, we could, but we don't. Well, I guess, I mean, I'm thinking out loud, I guess, um, uh, I mean, I agree with what you're saying. Uh, I think that uh, as a kind of advice, what we could do is you know uh, to uh, come up with examples of what uh, some operating systems are doing. For example, OpenBSD. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, I don't know if that com would completely address your comment, but I think it would be like you know it would alert the reader better. Okay. Like for example, if you just take a good one and a bad one and put them together and say this similar looking call had these very different properties that affect you. I think that that would at least alert the reader to say, oh, I still need randomness, but maybe I can't just do the simple way. Fair enough. Great, thanks. Thanks. Uh, Wendy is Jabber Relay for uh, Stephen Farrell, who asks, uh, why just numeric identifiers? Why not include others? Uh, we started with numeric identifiers, I mean, uh, because for most of the protocols that we were analyzing, uh, I guess, below the app layer, uh, they were numeric. I guess you, I mean, there are other identifiers. You could say that, you know, an email address is an identifier, but yeah, we could expand on that. Uh, yes. Yeah, thanks. And also a note for the room that uh, Alan thinks he's ready for remote participation when this is done. Great. Yes, I see him in Meet Echo. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. Thank you, Fernando. Thanks. So next up is Alan. Cock on DHCP 8021X, and let's see how this works. And Alan will need to tell me when he wants flight slides flipped. So if this doesn't work, I also have Alan on Skype, and we have a backup channel here. Ah, very good. good Thank you. Um, yeah. Yes. Yeah, Alan, can you request so that I see you in the queue, and then I can um, allow the speaker in the queue by pressing this red button, which looks super tempting, so I'd like to do it. <laughs> All right, he's in the queue. I press the magic red button. Uh, there hello. he is. Um, so, um, so, get the slides up. Let me just see one second where... Uh, 
I can't see this, the, the screen or where the slides are. Um, anyways, the, the document here talks about 802.1x and BHGP and came out as a result of some discussions in SAG. Um, if we can go to the next slide. So the second slide is the problem that DHGP is largely entirely unsecured and there's no ties between 802.1x and DHGP. So in situations where we have 802.1x, we have all this nice crypto, TLS, whatever, to secure the authentication, to prove who either end of the channel is. And once that's done, um, we have DHGP, which does not leverage any of that. Um, this is probably an issue. Now, as people have pointed out, um, the network switches can enforce some DHCP security, but the client has no idea as to whether or not this is actually happening. So if we go to the next slide, um, the proposal is to create a DHCP signing key from the 802.1x uh, master session key and then use that to sign DHCP packets. Um, the, so if we go to the next slide, um, how does it work? The RADIUS server generates the keys and the DHCP server uses them to verify and sign the packets. The client uses them to sign its packets. Um, this is not entirely um, accurate. I, based on some discussions we had in, in Radex about this yesterday, um, there's some updated issues. So if we go to the next slide about exchanging keys, um, the keys need to be exchanged securely um, via implementation defined methods. So at some level, the DHCP server needs to know what those keys are. So when it gets packets, it can verify the signature. Um, and it either needs to request those keys from the radius server or the radius server needs to push those keys to the DHCP server. How that's done is a bit outside the scope of this proposal. So if we go to the <laughs> next slide, um, what does it mean for this signing to happen? Um, at the minimum, it means that the DHCP and AAA servers can talk to each other and they're run by people who talk to each other. Um, whether or not this means that the DHCP server is trusted, um, is secure, I don't know. That's something for ongoing discussion. Um, if we go to the next slide, we have problems. There's a lot of details not worked out. This is just sort of a, a stab in the dark um, with an idea. DHCP does not really provide for capability negotiation. So the client just signs the keys and the server, sorry, signs the packets and the server just sees that or not and signs the replies or not. 802.1x doesn't really provide for capability negotiation. So there's no way to signal that, hey, I would like my DHCP packets after this to be signed and I can do that. Um, so this is all just sort of do things and hope the other end notices. Um, so if we go to the next slide, questions. Is this a good idea? Does it help security? Does it not hurt security? Can it be implemented? Will people implement it? These are all open. Um, the, the one thing which came out of the presentation of uh, this in Radex yesterday was that um, Stefan, among other people, pointed out that uh, this really has to be done. Th these keys have to be derived from the EEP MSK which goes in the radius packets to the access point. And one of the reasons for this is that um, the uh, radius server may not be co-located with a DHCP server in that the DHCP server is local and the radius server may be remote and you may end up 
proxying over half the internet. Um, and the only way that you can do any kind of key derivation and have it be secure and sane is base it on the MSK, which is sent to the access point. Um, this does have some positive benefits that the access point can now verify the signatures itself if it needs to or sign the packets. Um, so that's sort of a, a stab in the dark and the question as to whether or not this is useful, interesting, problematic or something is, I guess, open for discussion. So questions? Bob Moskowitz, HG Consulting. Um, interesting, and my first reaction to this is, should this be done directly in 8021X as potentially adding a new uh, 8021X uh, payload, let's call it DHCP OL, um, and then be able to directly use the, uh, um, the king within the 8021X for protecting this not just over um, the Wi-Fi use of 8021X, but also uh, Zigbee, um, Wyson's use of 8021X, and Ethernet's use of 8021X, and then have a, uh, a generic class of, uh, uh, of across media type uh, implementations. Um, of course, that does mean a par in 802, 8021, which has its own um, joys, but uh, um, I might think it may be better to take this directly to the people who own the, the media and look at security at that point? Um, quite possibly. The, the benefit about um, the current stab in the dark, as it were, is it doesn't really require um, integration or coordination with anyone else, right? The, the access point has this MSK and can derive a, a DHCP signing key the supplicant can drive a DHCP signing key. RFC 3118 has been around for a while, whether or not anyone implements it. Um, and so it may be good to get some input from the IEEE on this, but we, I, I don't know that that's required, but I'd, I'd leave it to Bob to know more as exactly uh, um, what the best approach forward there. I, I don't see Dorothy Stanley here who can comment more on the um, 802.11 MLME and what that would mean there. And the first body here that I would turn to would be Dorothy. Um, there may be somebody else here who, can, who at this meeting could comment on that. Um, I think it would still be um, a change um, to um, die 11. And like I said, you then leave Zigbee and uh, um, um, and, and, and Ethernet out in the code in, in that way. Okay. All right. Thank you, Alan. Thanks. And the last talk we have is the effect of ubiquitous encryption. Is Al Morton in the room? No. Okay. So I can handle this on the co editor. But I'll step down. Do it for you want a clicky thing? Oh, um, I can just like put right, these slides. I can flip them. All right. So let's see. The memo is intended to be a collection of things that are broken by encryption, and it's meant just to document. Oh, Alice here. So I'll continue, and then Al can pick up because. That was the plan. Um, so it's just meant to be a collection of um, things that were broken by encryption to document what was broken and um, what the specific function is that you're trying to achieve uh, by doing that, what data you need. It's not meant to um, fix any of these problems. Uh, obviously, some of them won't be able to, uh, you won't be able to do some of the functions documented, but the hope is that by documenting them, we could find other ways through creative means um, to solve the same problems and reach the same goals. So Al, if you wanna. Thanks Kathleen. Um, sorry for being late. They just ended a few minutes late next door. So uh, I guess that was a good start and, and uh, why don't we move to the next slide? All right. 
So in this draft, uh, we put on uh, some new material. Really, this is, it's been an interesting exercise because um, uh, we, we didn't try to make this exhaustive, but we did end up with a really long list. And, and one of the things you can appreciate about this is that it, it took a long time for people to come to grips with the technology that they were using and to find ways to measure it and to, to meet the regulations that they were up against and so forth. And, and so um, there's a lot of things, now, that, now we're beginning a time of uh, evolution of those capabilities. And it's, it's gonna take some time for that to happen as well. So um, in, the, in the draft, we have more recogn re recognition of the troubleshooting aspect. Uh, you'll see that, um, and that's about assuring performance and, um, and availability of the services. And that's, that's where we're kind of in a um, security and performance measurement. That's the uh, side of the house I work in. Uh, that's the, uh, the thing we have in common. Um, Steve Bellavin always used to tell me that um, security people are good performance measurement people too, because they know they can't introduce a new security technology that makes performance stink. And that way people won't use it. So I think we understand both sides of that. Um, so let's see here. The application service providers, uh, that, that's a new section contributed by one of our uh, folks. And also in, in section 4.1, the monitoring needs of the enterprise. So these are our, our sections where we've really expanded the, uh, the understanding of, of what people are doing today. And um, there was a lot of editorial cleanup to do but that's hopefully done now. And uh, so the next step we're thinking about is the ITF uh, last call. Uh, but we're gonna have some time for comments. Of course, there's, there's time right now for comments. So thanks. Thank you. And if um, anyone wants to take a look at the draft and contribute more text, there is still time for that. So if we've missed something, let's catch it and get it done. Thanks, Al. Any questions? Yep, go ahead. Hi, uh, Darren Pettis with U.S. Bank. Uh, thanks for the right, writing that paper, Al. It was great to see it laid out so professionally, uh, some of the challenges and Kathleen challenges that we face today. Um, we're kind of stuck in a bind between wanting to move forward with the uh, encryption that they've laid out so well in TLS 1.3 and meeting our regulatory needs. So still looking for solutions on uh, how to move forward there, even if it's in an interim manner until we get to a permanent solution. Appreciate any input. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Mike Ackerman with Blue Cross. Echoing Darren's thanks, you guys did a wonderful job here and it's starting to get information out there that us clueless enterprises badly need. So thank you, thank you, thank you very much. I have a question or maybe a plea for help that maybe is out of sequence here, but let me ask it anyway. In, in the event that we do need help, that we actually realize some of this stuff is coming at us, how best to get, the, it's really two questions, how best to get that information out to all of us enterprises that aren't here, which is most of us, and then what to do about it in terms of crafting solutions? Okay, so um, there's the IETF announce list. Um, uh, you can follow the publication of, of when drafts are published. Yes, we have a lot of working groups, um, but the IETF announce list might be a good place to start. Um, uh, you know, some of us give talks at industry forums. Um, I mean, it's difficult. Uh, the IETF, we're, we're made up of uh, individual participants, right? So, um, it's driven by what individuals, you know, have time to do and, you know, in terms of going out and talking in other forums. Um, I know Stephen and I and probably the TLS chairs and people working on TLS have been invited to speak at various um, places. Uh, I know one thing I tried doing was I had recorded a presentation through EMC um, on uh, the crypto trends. So there's a recorded one out there and uh, that was gosh, at least a year ago that that was done. Um, 
and this was noted within that presentation. So we've made, I mean, we've all made some efforts. Stephen's talked a bunch in a number of forums on pervasive monitoring and related drafts to that. Um, but that was, I mean, these were on invited bases um, for, for both of us and the number of talks and things we've done. If you have suggestions or if there's other places where, you know, we should be speaking, um, you know, it's not just the ADs, but um, any of the participants yeah, who my, are my, experts my hope in areas was can help. That we could leverage the ITF or maybe work within the constructs of the IETF to craft solutions rather than us being left to our own devices. Oh, that solutions. Would be very I thought dangerous. Yeah. Well, I, I guess my question was two part. Get the information out there so we realize this is coming. I now do because of this week, but I'm in a rarity in terms of enterprises. I will go back and tell everyone that'll listen to me, which isn't very many, but um, and try to get the word out that way. But there's got to be a more effective mechanism, and I hope that's through the IETF. So that's the information dissemination. That's one. And two, the more important thing to me is how do we arrive at solutions? And I'd love to do that through the IETF again not out on our own or trying to pressure vendors into doing things to come up with standard solutions that we can all use and leverage. So. Right. So documenting the problem is one way to have it recognized as a problem so that other smart people who might come up with creative solutions can see that that's a problem to be solved, right? So maybe um, academics seeing this um, documented problem sets might be of help. Paul Hoffman, and just for the people in the room who aren't hearing what he means by solutions, he means not encrypting or encrypting in a way where, and I just want to be really clear because your document is wonderful in the sense that it lists the problems and leaves them as problems because in fact, those problems are in fact solutions for many of us in this room. Ubiquitous <laughs> encryption is something that we've been working on purposefully for decades. Um, so. I I hope that you don't take those comments as something where you should be expanding your document into solutions. Um, I, I'm not with your co-chair. I'm certainly not worried that, that you wouldn't have noticed that. Um, but I, I believe that asking the IETF for solutions to a problem, which is I have a regulatory thing. My boss wants to be able to snoop at traffic. Um, I'm an ISP and I think I can monetize traffic if I could see it more and such like that. I don't believe that's the scope of the IETF. So maybe as you are going out and describing the problems to people, you can also describe the scope and the tenor of the IETF. Okay. So in terms of solutions, I do think that there's more than um, uh, the ones that we find objectionable, right? So the ones that we've agreed are objectionable. Right. I and I'm sure many people agree that if we increase logging, then some of the troubleshooting functions that have been complained about um, would help solve the problem so that you will not need to peer into sessions, right? Like a wrong password uh, was an example given, and that really should just be done by logging. So vendors, you know, anyone in the room who works for a vendor, I know I've made a concerted effort within my own company to help um, you know, state the importance of this. And a lot of the engineers who worked on things like um, IPsec encryption for our specific use cases, they, um, they've made a point of, of increasing, you know, logging and, and being able to do the networking, troubleshooting, administration tech uh, responsibilities. So I think that's the responsibility of every vendor to go back and do that. I know one of the complaints, because I've raised this previously, um, uh, on this specific um, question is that it's impossible to go back to every vendor. However, you know, we have a lot represented here, so we could each go back and try to do a good job of that. Then in our drafts, we can also make a concerted effort to make sure there are notes um, explicitly stating that sp things are logged better. And there may be other solutions, right? So if folks who are creative could take a look at ubiquitous encryption draft, and start thinking up other ways besides breaking encryption. Are there endpoint things that we can do? Are there logging things that we can do? Are there other solutions that we haven't thought of that would not be objectionable? 
And I can say I'm going to walk away happy now because this is the type of dialogue that I would love to see where we're talking about solutions. My first comment, though, is extended logging will be great. It will not be a panacea, though. But at least we're sure. starting to talk about what potential solutions are. And one of them is not to abolish encryption. I'm from healthcare. We need more of it, but we need to be able to manage it, too. Right. If we could ever get to a point of more secure endpoints, like through SACM and system hygiene and through encrypted channels, then some of these things should really start to fall away once we get to a better security state. A recommendation, maybe a non-working group mailing list inside the IETF, and then uh, reach out to the various trade groups and the rest of it to get their participation and asking their questions. And with IETFers then pointing them to things of interest and then how go from there. But if uh, the gentleman from Blue Cross and, and the, the banking person were to uh, step forward and, and make a, uh, and, and request a, uh, a non-working group mailing list, that may be one way uh, that, that you can do it, Kathleen. Sure, yes, thank you, that's a good idea. Uh, is it Wendy yeah. up next? Just standing here in case the driver scribes. Oh, okay, Nalini. Okay. Oh, sure. Okay. Yeah, Nalini Elkins. You know, I just kind of wanted to play out some of these ideas. I wonder if that would be appropriate because I just, you know, you guys just did such a great job in describing so many of the problems in such detail. I really want to thank you guys, you know, for all the, the all the hard work. And you know, um, it's, um, you know, I just, I'm just kind of thinking out loud too, I guess really, I would just love to play out some of these ideas about logging, you know, I just, and I wonder if that would be appropriate. It's like maybe on this, on this email list is like, is like take some problems and some sample topographic, you know, some, some network topography, something like that and play them out. And I wonder if that would be a, an interesting draft to do maybe in SAG for next time is if if we if I go back together maybe and whoever would like to you know as I say I'm just it's like now it's like now I hear that idea I'm like oh let me try see what happens with a real problem like what needs to be logged to where you know what I mean because definitely some of the work that we're doing for uh, PDM for the performance embedded performance and diagnostic metrics in IPv6 is going to do a number of things for uh, response time, you know, the server times that you need. So if you need that, then I think we'd probably have an answer. Plus, I mean, I, I hope they can revive some of that because I was just really looking forward to some more embedded diagnostics and stuff. I mean, I, I mean, diagnosis is, is uh, you know, I, I, is my, I mean, I love diagnostics. And so I would love to see, you know, like, like, how do we do this? But does that make sense to you? I mean, if we can play, does that make sense to have to play out some of these things in reality because I'd love to see follow-ons I mean you guys have opened up such such an area I'd love to see follow-ons am I babbling yes, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Nalini thanks for your contribution to the draft <laughs> <laughs> thanks Al now I have a relay from Stephen Pearl uh, who wanted to say uh, not sure I agree with Bob that this was all about TLS we have the new work mailing list already and I'm opposing a mailing list for this one right now hi uh, Daniel Khan Gilmore from the ACLU so I, I wanted to push back uh, on on Paul a little bit and say that I'm not sure that uh, uh, we, I, I hope that people don't frame the problems that are described in this document as the fact of encryption. Um, if the problems are being framed as the fact of encryption, then it's sort of game over and we're not going to have a very productive discussion. If the problems are framed in the, in the sense of we have these operational needs, then we can talk about other ways to solve these problems without breaking the crypto. So um, I think it's important to make sure that we approach it from that viewpoint. There, you know, the reason that, that engineers in this room are pushing for crypto, you know, there's a bunch of good reasons for it. We can go over them again if we want to <laughs> review the, the pervasive monitoring draft and other pieces. Um, but the, you know, as long as we make sure that the problems are not stated as things are encrypted, if it's like, I mean, as we've said, you know, we have we have to, you know, debug failed passwords, then problems like what Kathleen has outlined are, are the are the kinds of solutions that people can point you to um, without breaking some of the benefits of actually getting your network traffic fully encrypted. Yeah, thank you. That was we were very careful about the wording to um, bring both sides of this together. 
Uh, Steve Fenter, I, I want to echo Mike's earlier comment that when encryption is added in a particular environment, that solutions need to also be added at the same time for anything that breaks. And if, if there are non-decryption ways to fix problems, that's great. But if the non-decryption ways are partial solutions, that needs to be acknowledged also that we don't have an adequate way to fix the thing that's broken. And I think a lot more enterprise input is needed in this organization so that people are aware of what breaks when things are encrypted so that problems can be dealt with right up front as encryption is being discussed rather than encryption being put in, things breaking and then enterprises having to scramble to figure out what to do. Yeah, that's Darren again. Um, I wanted to thank Daniel if that's a good point. Uh, we, don't, we don't have to have decryption. I mean, we'd rather not. <laughs> and, and, and to be clear, we're only talking about inside the enterprise, not on the internet. Keep everything as is there. So if there's another better solution, we'd love to, to work with anybody on that. Um, that'd be our preference. Um, the problem is we're kind of stuck in a bind. We really don't have an option to not follow the regulatory bodies and to perform the different security things that are needed to enhance the security within the enterprise. So we're just looking for a way forward. And, and like Steve said, uh, with TLS 1.3 moving forward, um, it, it, it puts us in a bind. Not now, we know it's a couple of years out, but we, I think it's a te tough technical solution that needs uh, time and, and work to come together to figure out how we can continue to meet our regulatory requirements um, before TLS 1.3 is fully adopted and, and we're um, required to adopt it. So that's why we're, we're asking for people to really help with us um, because we can't move to TLS 1.3 as it stands today and still meet our regulatory requirements. So that's the bind we're in. So sorry to be continuing to beat this horse. Um, we're just looking for a solution. Appreciate any help. Thank you. Thank you. So I think that was the last in queue. Um, and uh, just a few notes, just make sure that the problems are documented and that gives uh, you know, folks an opportunity to recognize that a problem will result from this and then hopefully we can help develop creative solutions that um, maintain encrypted sessions and what we already have consensus for um, within the IETF. Um, all right, so I guess now we go to open mic. Thanks, Al. Welcome, thank you everybody. All right, anything for open mic? Hi, uh, this is Yavnir. Um, I wanted to make uh, one more try to push for the um, uh, security considerations draft that we're trying to uh, revise the RFC 35 something. 52. Thanks. Um, so far, we've had uh, zero comments on the list. I'll send another uh, mail to the SAG list, uh, hopefully getting some replies. Otherwise, uh, I don't see how we can really proceed with this. So I mean, I can just do what I've already done, uh, update references, uh, remove references to TLS 1.0 and not recommend that anymore. But um, if you want any other changes, uh, we'll need some community input. Yeah, so how many people are familiar with 3552? I hope. It's an important document. I'm just gonna add on to Yoav's plea. It's used by other um, other areas quite a bit to formulate their security consideration sections. So those of you who do SecDIR reviews, you might have a little less to find if this is more robust and gets at all the points that we would like people to cover in their security consideration sections. Um, it's an old document. I know Stephen and I had provided comments on our initial review. We both thought it was important to do this revision. I know other people thought it was important to do this revision. I'm sure many of you would have some good comments and feedback. So I'm just adding on to Yoav's plea to um, add, add add your feedback, read this draft, and and contribute your feedback so that we can um, have better security consideration sections and help guide other groups, especially if you're cross area. Thank you. Anyone else for open mic? All right. I guess this is it. Thanks.
Did you think that there was only one session? It's in the mobile app. It's on the mobile app. Oh. I was like, where is Jeff Hodges? And then Warren stepped up. So.